How's everyone doing? Is my audio good? Audio is great. Cool, cool. Cool. Hope everybody had a great weekend. Um, today we're going to be jumping in to talk about some usability. So I know last week you did some, some prototyping with Brandon. So we're going to jump into usability testing and how to make sure that once you have those prototypes, once you have those mockups, you're able to test them with your users and make sure that they're able to easily understand uh, the interface and accomplish the task at hand. So uh, today we're going to be talking about a few different types of usability testing. Uh, hopefully everybody had a chance to, to go over some of the, the pre-lesson pre uh, material, uh, but we're, we're going to talk through this today in lecture and hopefully I'll be able to get some input from you guys on, uh, on some of the pros and cons of the different methodologies. So let's start out uh, by talking about preference tests. So a lot of us have probably done informal preference tests already. Um, a preference test is basically just for understanding um, what, the, what user preferences are for two different versions of the same designs. So if you've ever designed two versions of the same screen and showed it to somebody and said, which of these do you prefer, then you've done an informal preference test. So uh, preference tests are, are really good for some things, but not necessarily uh, for other things. Uh, so let's, let's talk about some of the things that preference tests are useful for. Uh, does anybody have, have any ideas of, of what a preference test might be useful for testing? Is that the same as A-B testing? Uh, so it's preference testing is similar to A-B testing in some ways, but not quite the same. So an A-B test is about creating two different versions of the product in application. So maybe um, I want to test out whether um, search or browse is a better way for somebody to find the information they're looking for on my homepage. So it needs to test where I build both of those things and, and expose half of, the, half of my users or some segment of my users to version A and then the other half to version B and see which one actually performs better in the wild. Whereas a preference test is more for when, when you just have lookups, you're just showing the user design, you're showing the, the subject design and asking them which one they prefer. So the preference test is more hypothetical, more for mockups or prototypes, whereas A-B testing is, is for uh, when you've actually built seeing which of two versions performs. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I think somebody, we're getting some background noise from somebody. So, oh, okay, cool. That's gone now. All right, awesome. I think that was, that was just the students of background for Serena. Okay, cool. Uh, so given that, uh, what do you think a preference test would be useful for? see uh, which path uh, a user prefers taking on the same step that you might have different paths for? So, uh, so preference test is usually more used for static screens. I should have been clearer about that. So uh, we're going to talk about some, about some other types of tests that are really useful for determining which paths users expect to take. Preference test is kind of more for, for showing a static screen uh, and asking which, which one the users prefer more. So, it's not as much about their actions as it is about uh, is about their their reactions to to a screen. So, like, how does it make them feel? Uh, which one feels which of two designs feels more trustworthy? Just which one do they prefer? Uh, and then asking follow up questions about why. So, related to color and visuals or placement of buttons or objects. Right. Right. So, so a preference test. A lot of it is. What it's very useful for is things like look and feel. So like testing out different brand colors, different styles, uh, which one of these feels, which one of these would you be more likely to trust with your credit card? Uh, the blue one or the red one? Uh, and so being able to, to test preferences for things like that, uh, more, so that more so than behaviors, but we are gonna get into, uh, into testing user paths and behaviors as well. So that's a, that's a really good distinction to have come up. So essentially, is this just UI as opposed to UX? That kind of the. Uh... Um, yeah, you you could think of it like that because usually uh, a preference test is actually best done at high fidelity. Uh, so I know a lot of the testing we talk about, we say it's actually best to do it with the wireframe or with the sketch because you're trying to understand 
the, the user's behavior and path and whether the flow makes sense. But for preference tests, it's actually the opposite. It's best to do it high fidelity because we want to we want to get their their kind of emotional reaction uh, to the to the product in its styled form. Cool. Thanks for thanks for bringing that up. Um, okay. Any other questions about preference tests? And we're going to be actually creating one of these for our in class exercise today. But it's a, it's a pretty simple it's a pretty simple uh, structure for just determining uh, the better between two alternatives. And when you do when you do a crazy eights exercise or something like that, you can generate a lot of different versions of the same design. You, know, you did did one of the did some of those last week. Uh, so when you do end up with all these different versions and you're not sure which is the best, preference test is a good way to establish that. All right. Start with someone speaking. Okay, so. Um, okay, oh, sorry. And one thing, one other thing that I wanted to touch on here for preferences was being able to avoid bias. Um, there's, um, I think we've, we've talked a little bit about um, how people, te people tend to favor uh, designs that are at the beginning or the end of a sequence. Or, or items that are at the beginning of end of sequence tend to be more memorable. So if you're showing uh, if you're showing um, a set of designs to a group of users, you want to try to mix up the order of them, scramble them, because sometimes if sometimes people can be biased towards either the first one or the last one in a series. And then we and then it's also very useful to ask the follow up questions because we want to get that qualitative insight as well as the quantitative of just how many people preferred which one. All right, so let's talk about the next type, type of test. So this is a really cool one. Uh, the first click test is just what it sounds like. It's when you, you show a user a design and ask them to accomplish some task, what is the first thing that they want to click on? And the first click is actually the most important step in, uh, in accomplishing any task because that establishes the direction that you're going. Uh, so if we're testing out a landing page with a with a clear call to action, uh, or if we're testing out a navigation and we want to make sure that the user is able to find the information they're looking for, then we could use a first click test to see whether they're taking that first step in the right direction. And uh, we talked we talked about uh, information architecture and hierarchy, and these are the kinds of things that you're going to be testing with first click. And so the what we're looking at when we do a first click is uh, is are two two primary things. One is where does the user click? Obviously, are they heading in the right direction? And then the other is how long it takes the user to make their first click. So if the design is really complicated and maybe unclear, they might have to do a lot of thinking before they decide where they're going to click first. So a good design not only would they click in the right direction or the the shortest path to what they're looking for, but they would also be able to do it relatively quickly. And here's an, here's an example of a first click test. And this is a pretty funny one. This is an example of one that might take a really long time for the user to find what they're looking for. All right, so this is an example of a test in Usability Hub, which we're going to be using together a little bit later today. So we've been invited to participate in a short test. And it's asking us, uh, where would you click to try to find the weather for New York City, New York? And can I have a brave volunteer to, to take this test, to, to guide me? Who wants to do it? Sure, I'll do it. Who's that? Nevia. Hey, hey, there you are. Yeah. Okay, cool. OK, so where would you click to find the weather for New York City, New York? And so once I click this button, it's going to show us an image. And I'll give you time to, to think about it and just let me know where I should move my mouse. Well, there's nothing much on the page, so I guess I'm going to click. Oh, right. So once, once, uh, once I click this button, the click to view image, then it'll show me the web page. OK, go ahead and do that. Then. OK, you ready? I would, yeah. OK. Um, I would click on New York on the map, I guess. Uh, I is, actually don't know where that is, so, <laughs> wait, is, uh, okay. so uh, let's see. I should have said, where's New York, and let you do it yourself. 
<laughs> yeah, I would either go to forecast. I would go to forecast. OK. And so then it's going to ask us to confirm our click. Yeah. And so this is a pretty busy website, right? So that took us a little while to figure out where we should click. And we don't even know if this is the shortest route. So what did we expect to happen after clicking forecasts? Um, I would expect, I guess, maybe a list of cities or something where I can choose. Um, All right. So that's, uh, that was our first first click test. But see how there were, there were a couple of things there was do we click on the do we click on the correct in, in the on the correct uh, link and then also how long does it take us to do that and for that one it was, it's pretty long was, and there are a lot of options was, yeah there were several other places like there was a zip code I could possibly yeah. enter the zip code for New York there but then if I don't know it then I wouldn't there was also a search so it was confusing I'll just yeah. try do you think, oh, we've already taken the test, I guess, so we can't look at it again. But do you think that website had good uh, information architecture? Um, not, 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 <laughs> not so good, I think. <laughs> not I don't think so. It, it definitely didn't have very clear hierarchy. Uh, yeah. the, the primary action someone's probably taking on that page is to look for the weather in a city. But there were like six different places that I could see that, that might have gotten me there within a few clicks. There wasn't really one clear item. Yeah. Yeah. And the highlight was like a map. Like the first thing you notice is a big map. And right. I'm not so sure what to do with that. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So does anyone have any questions about first click tests? Why do you think the first click is, is so important? Why aren't we testing the, the first, second, and third clicks? Normally, people after one or two clicks, they lose interest, and you really yeah. want to get them where they want to be fast. Yes, that's very true. Um, and if they're if they're taking three steps in the wrong direction, then they're probably going to, going to be getting frustrated. So, what we want to worry about is is keeping it simple and making sure that their that their first attempt gets them at least a step in the direction of the information they're looking for. All right, ready to move on to the next test? And this is the third of three that we'll be talking about today. So the next one is the five second test. So this is a really good test of, of whether a design is clearly communicating its purpose. So uh, web users tend to leave a site if they don't understand it quickly. And there's, as a rule of thumb, if a site is well designed, if a web page is well designed, you should be able to understand the, the general purpose of that page and what kind of tasks you can accomplish there within five seconds. So it seems like a really short period of time, but, uh, but you'll see when we, when we put it into practice, it's a really good test of whether a site is communicating its, its value or not. So the way that the five second test works is you, you, tell, you explain to the user um, the purpose of the test. Uh, first, you, you need to set their expectations and tell them what kind of, or tell them uh, what they're trying to accomplish, not tell them what kind of web page it is, because that's kind of what we're testing. Um, so you want to you want to tell them what kind of information they're looking for, or what kind of task they're trying to accomplish, um, and then oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up the two tests. Um, so you don't tell them anything. This <laughs> test, I was thinking of the of the first click still. So for this one, we're trying to we're showing them the website without any prior knowledge. And we're looking for them to be able to tell us the purpose of that website or answer some follow-up questions like, what are the main parts of the page you can recall? Who do you think is the intended audience? Did the design appear trustworthy? What was your impression of the design? So just kind of high-level questions about the site uh, after showing it up to them for just five seconds. And so if the design is clear, they should be able to answer those questions relatively well. So this is another type of test that we can, we can also create within Usability Hub. Uh, and you can set it to be five seconds or longer, uh, depending on the complexity of the web page. Uh, but generally, five seconds is a good rule. And so what do you think, th what do you think this is useful for? So we talked about how um, the pre preference test is great for like look and feel, 
Uh, do you think this is more about form or more about function? Probably more about function. Right, right. I would say so too. So this is about understanding the purpose of the web page and what you can do on this web page. So do you think it's, is it best to, or when, when in the design cycle is this useful? Is it like kind of when you're working with, with sketches or low fidelity or is it better for high fidelity? It will be better when high fidelity. Yeah, so it was definitely used to high fidelity. Uh, it's, and uh, if you do if you do this on on low fidelity mockups, you're going to want to do it again uh, once you have high fidelity because sometimes the styles and the colors and the, any changes to the spacing and things like that can also affect their perception of the website. So this is actually useful for low or high fidelity because at low fidelity you can be testing you can be testing just sort of like uh, the structure of the web page whether whether it communicates its purpose well. But even if you do that, you want to do it again once you get to high fidelity, just to make sure that none of the style additions that you've made have changed the user's perception of what the what the website is intended for, um, who the intended audience is, like whether it still appears trustworthy once you've once you've added some colors and things like that. And here is an example of a five second test that we can take together. Can I have another volunteer for this? I can do this one. All right. Who's talking? Is that Ivan? Ivan. Yeah. Okay. All right. So do visitors understand what a page is about? So you'll see a website on the next page, and we'll have a short time to look at it, try to figure out what the company shown does. So pretty high level question. Ready? So what does this company do, Ivan? You have five seconds. And you can answer af after those five seconds. Um, I think this was like a, a messaging okay. website okay. Uh, for companies, like a business. So you can do uh, maybe employees messaging each other or something like that. Employee messaging tool. Does that work? Or platform? Yeah. All right. And I, I don't know what the right answer was, uh, but here's some follow up questions. Do they have, do they offer a software product or professional service? I, I think it was a more professional service. All right. That's it. So that was the five second test. So five seconds can be pretty short. But uh, to answer some general questions, like what does this company do? It's a really good test to see how clearly you're communicating. Now, have you guys have, have you ever been to any, or have you been to any websites recently um, that where you went to it and you you had to look at like, multiple pages just to figure out what the company actually does? Not I know really. I know I've been looking I've been looking at a lot of nonprofit websites lately, and I found that nonprofits tend to tend to seem to have trouble communicating on their websites what they do. And I think a lot of that is because they do a lot of different things just that are all kind of vaguely related to uh, some, some sort of impact related goal. Um, but uh, a lot of the time I have to browse all these pages, like I'm looking at the about, I'm looking at the history of the company, trying to figure out what they actually do. So some of those websites could probably benefit from this kind of testing. Does it actually tell you what it is about? Sorry? Does it actually tell you what it is about? Uh, so usually, a lot of the time it's spread out over the website across a lot of different pages. There's no clear UVP. All right. Any questions about five second tests? All right. So. Now let's talk about uh, online user testing. So since we have so many uh, online tools now, uh, it's made user testing a lot more accessible. You don't need to. You don't necessarily need to have a company that has the resources to, uh, you know, to to bring people in in person to do all of your testing. Um, you can you can reach more people faster. Uh, it's a lot cheaper. Um, I just wanted to have a little discussion 
uh, together about uh, what some of the pros and cons are of online user testing versus in-person user testing. So let's start with uh, let's start with some of the benefits of online user testing. I know I just listed a couple, but let's dig in a little more. So uh, what do you guys think are uh, some of the some of the benefits of testing online, remotely versus testing in person? In online, you can probably get more people to do it because they could tell you instantly, hey, yeah, you do have some time, give me the link, and they do it. Right. Yeah, you're going, versus, you don't have to somebody to come into an office, right? Yeah, yeah, versus getting, you know, random people or something, hey, do you have some time to come over? I actually right. got to schedule that. <laughs> yes, definitely. So so you can you can reach more people faster. What else? Is it more accurate? You know, so you're not, you know, um, somehow influencing a user throughout the testing. It's just they're on their own doing the test. Oh, that's, that's an interesting point. So since they're remote, they're isolated from the tester. So if there's any tester bias that's that could be coming in, like through maybe your body language or your reactions to things you're doing, if you're not careful about that, um, having that that physical buffer between you and the user could be a way of eliminating the the. Um, bias that's coming from the person who's administering the test. What other benefits might there be to the person being in their own home when they're doing it? Maybe um, because they're in the environment in which they would typically be using an app or website you'd get a more accurate answer than you would in an unfamiliar environment. Exactly, Brandon. Um, so I have a friend who does user research at Google, and, uh, and most of her time is actually spent doing home visits. And she works on, on one of the Google travel products. And so she'll go to the people's houses and, say, and basically say, like, pretend I'm not here. Uh, just go about what the start. Uh, show me how you would typically book a trip, like, in terms of, like, where where would you sit? What are your surroundings? Are you on your phone? Are you on your computer? Uh, you know, are you, are you uh, trying to keep track of your kids at the same time? So having somebody in the context that they're actually doing the thing can be a lot more accurate than having them in some, uh, you know, some lab or office that they've never been to. So that's one of, one of the really big benefits of remote testing. And what's really cool is that there are even some tools now where sometimes, um, you can get people to do impromptu tests while they're actually going through, uh, while they're actually going through the process themselves. So, say you're booking a trip on Google, you might get something that pops up that says, "Hey, do you want to take a five-minute test?" So you can actually catch them while they're in the process of really doing the thing that you're trying to test. So, not only are you not asking them to come into a building or a lab, but you might not even have to ask them to do some activity that they weren't already doing. You can catch them in the mindset that they're actually in while they're while they're booking the flight or doing whatever it is you're trying to test. Cool. Um, what else? What, what are the other pros of user testing? How about time? We talked about how you can, you can test with more people more quickly, but what about what about um, your team's time? If you don't actually need to have a moderator there for every test, you can do them asynchronously, right? You can just send out the link, and people can take the test on their own time. You don't need to say you have a hundred a uh, hundred thirty minute long tests. You don't need to have your researchers uh, be present. Uh, for 130 minute tests, people can just do it on their own time. All the researchers have to do is create the test and send it out. Yeah, less money spending too. No driving, no yep. time spent outside looking for people. Yeah, definitely. It's just it's just more resource efficient in general. Cool. And then the other great thing is there there are all kinds of sites out there like usertesting.com and usability hub, which we'll talk about, that already have these big databases of users. And you know, within minutes, you can just create a test, and then you can target it to specific demographics. And then you can just 
move on to do other things while the results are coming in. So it's just like hundreds of times more efficient than it would have been previously to go out and find the right test subjects, get them to come in, watch them doing it. And there are even some types of hybrid online testing. Uh, like for example, uh, usertesting.com gives you the option to have a video recording of the person while they're using the app. So you can still get those cues like body language, even if you're not there. So uh, internet has unlocked a lot of new opportunities for user testing. But let's talk about some of the drawbacks. So why might, uh, why might user testing be less effective than in-person testing? Sorry, why might online user testing be less effective? Are you able to target um, your ideal audience? Target your ideal audience? Mm -hmm. Oh, in person? Mm -hmm. uh, can you? Versus. So um, being able to target your ideal audience in person versus um, a pool online? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure I completely follow. So when you um, set user testing through an online link, uh, are you still able to filter by your target audience, or is it just anybody can do it? So it depends on what service you're using, but a lot of tools like usertesting.com and Usability Hub do let you segment your audience demographically to find your target audience. So it does allow that. Um, and can be, uh, I guess, I guess sourcing your audience is a little bit is a little bit separate from whether you're testing them uh, in person or remotely. Um, but a lot of the online tools do have really good, uh, really good platforms for sourcing users. And actually, what one benefit that that I forgot to mention for online user testing is you can you can get a much more diverse and wider pool of candidates because you're not locked into one geographical area. So you would be able to test with people in all different countries uh, or from all different socioeconomic backgrounds, even if they aren't available uh, directly in the area around where your company is. So that's one more benefit, actually, of online user testing. What are some, what are some other benefits of actually having the person in the room with you? I mean, I think the, the feedback emotionally they get confused um or anything like that they don't have you there to to ask so i kind of see you being confused what's troubling you or anything like that i think in person you will have a little bit more uh, concrete feedback yeah i think you you hit on two really important parts there one was being able to read their their body language live uh, and their reactions and then two being able to to follow to ask follow-up questions or offer guidance if needed, uh, because if, if somebody's just uh, using a website and answering questions on a form, then you're not there to actively participate with them and say like, oh, like why, like what's, uh, you know, um, what's confusing to here or what's going through, what do you expect to happen when you click on that button? You can't be as dynamic if you're just using a, a test and you're not actually there having a conversation with the person. Cool. Anything else? All right. So yeah, so with, with in-person testing, you can get some deeper results. You can really dig in and react to, uh, to what, the, what the tester is seeing and doing as they go. Whereas online user testing, you don't necessarily that get that, kind of, that same kind of feedback. And so another, another term that we use a lot is moderated versus unmoderated. So moderated is when you have when you actually have uh, a, a tester there who's administering the test. Unmoderated is when they're doing the user is testing it asynchronously on their own time uh, without without uh, somebody from the team there administering the test. All right, so let's put some of this into action. So. Uh, we're going to get into Usability Hub now, and we're going to actually create our own uh, our own user tests, and we're going to be creating a um, a first click test, and it's going to be for Bing, everybody's favorite search engine. All right, still exist. Yes, <laughs> apparently. Uh, okay, so um, let's actually take a minute now for everybody to go to usabilityhub.com and just create yourself an account. 
and it's going to ask you a few questions about like what kind of company you're from and stuff like that and just put, put whatever is, is closest. And let, let, let me know if anybody gets stuck on this. I think someone's got some screaming kids. All right, is, that, is anybody still working on it? Okay. All right. Okay, so let's get started. If you're, if you're still working on setting up the account, you'll have time to do that at the beginning of the in-class challenge. So let's start out by creating this first click test for Bing. So when you go into Usability Hub, um, you should land on a dashboard like this that will show any tests that you currently have. I don't have any right now, so it's an empty state. So create the test. And you'll see uh, here it just asks us for our test name. So I'm just going to call this Bing usability tests, or sorry, being uh, first click test. And uh, I don't think, oh, I'm just going to call this project so that we can put all of our tests in it. And then you'll see, I think it will let us customize our welcome screen, but only if we upgrade our plan on usability hub. So for this, we're going to be creating a first click test. So we'll select first click. And you can add multiple, uh, you can add multiple, te multiple types of tests to a project. But I believe for the basic version, Kylo was saying that there's a limit. Um, so we're going to just be creating one test per project. So for the first click test, um, let me just grab the text. So what we're trying to test here is whether some, what, the, what somebody clicks when they're looking for a video on Bing. So for our instructions, I'm just copy and pasting this from the, from the project guidelines. Imagine that you landed on this page and you want to search for a video. Where would you click first? And then we're going to add our design. So since this, this is the first click test, we're just testing one, one screen. So I'm going to upload this picture. This is just a screenshot from Bing's homepage. Cool. So we're asking them where they would click when they're looking for a video. And then we're going to add a follow-up question. So this is where we dig a little bit deeper. We want to know why they chose to click what they clicked. And we could also add more. What did you choose to, to why did you choose to click there? Be specific. I'm going to add one more just, just for the heck of it. Um, what did you expect to happen 
when you clicked. Cool. And I'm just going to make these two required. Any questions so far on what we're doing? We can preview the image here. But okay, and then when, when we're done with all of that, we can press save and continue. No, don't want to recruit participants. How do I close this? Okay, so then I go over to the results page. I can I can share it, can export it. Can copy my link. And so this is what you're going to be doing for your assignment later. And then you can share it with, with people who can take the test. So I'm just going to go to this link for now. And, and does somebody want to volunteer to take the Bing test who hasn't done one yet? Sure. Oh, I'll go ahead. <clears throat> who is that? Serena. I'll oh. go ahead. All right, Serena. So here is our test. Oh, wait, sorry. No, usability. <laughs> <laughs> it's not very intuitive. I had just done preview before. Recruitment link, there we go. Let's try this. And maybe I need to open up an, an incognito window or something. Since I'm locked. Okay, there we go. Okay, cool. Can you see my screen, Serena? Yep. All right, so let's start this. So imagine that you just landed on this page and you wanted to search for a video. Where would you click first? Ready? Yep. Click on videos at the top. All right. Why did you choose to click there? These because it said videos. <laughs> <laughs> and what did you expect to happen when you clicked? I expect to see the exact same layout with the search, the Bing search, uh -huh. but this time for videos. Cool. Who knows how that page looks like, right? <laughs> what does Bing.com look like? Hey, that's what it looks like. Should we see what actually happens? Yes. Sort of that. So it still shows the search, but then it also starts showing us uh, how we can get an eight pack. It's like a knockoff YouTube. <laughs> yeah, it is. Bing is just is like a knockoff Google in general. Um, Okay, cool. Um, so does everybody feel like they are ready to create their own first click test? I'm very distracted by that watch. Very curious. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. So, I know it was a little confusing with the share link. So when you do when you do need to do that, go to your dashboard, click the settings wheel, and then recruitment link. And then it'll give you a link that you can copy and share. So, okay, let's move on to our first in-class challenge. So let's take 15 minutes. Uh, you're gonna take a screenshot of any website, pick your favorite website or a website they use a lot, log into your usability hub and create a first click test to that website. So make sure you add instructions. So this should be around some sort of task, like, um, like um, you know, say you wanna buy a pair of shoes or you wanna, you wanna book a movie ticket. Um, so come up with just one very clear task, and we're just looking to see whether they take that first step in the right direction. And then you're going to add uh, one, or uh, if you still have some time, add two follow-up questions to, to try to get into the user's head and why they clicked that link and what they were expecting to see when they did. So then after that, we'll, we'll just have a few people share what they created, and we can take their tests. Any questions on that? 
All righty. Cool. Uh, I will set a timer. And I'll put a screenshot of the in-class challenge in Slack. And if you have any questions, uh, just drop them in the uh, drop them in the in UX seven underscore help, and uh, we'll be able to help you out. And also, if you if you do finish up early, just uh, raise your hand so that we can see if anyone still needs more time. Um, I already have mine completed. Should I just post it to to the UX? Um, yeah, let me actually create a. Um, I'm just going to create a post, and then we can add them all in the thread, just so it doesn't get super noisy. Okay.
And if you if you do finish early, feel free to start taking the other students' tests. One second. Just added that.
Guys, <clears throat> some of your links are uh, directly to the results of your tests. Oh, okay. Uh, if you do, you have a, a specific one that's doing that. Brandon and Miguel. Yeah. Um, they both get. I, I just sent screenshots. That's what they get. That's what I get. Okay, I'll update it. Thanks for okay. the feedback. Cool. Thanks, guys. Um, let uh, let us know if you have any issues with that. Oh yeah, so you might need to go back to the dashboard and and specifically share the recruitment link. Oh, I see. Thanks. Yep, no problem. I think that's what I did the first time too. It's not super clear. Is anybody still working on theirs? Looks like we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and we might have like one more. So let's take another couple minutes and uh, feel free to just keep taking these tests for each other. It would be cool to see somebody's results together. Cool to see what websites people chose. Where would you click to look for handbags? Okay, everybody. Let's uh, let's pause here, and since we're we're getting to about ten o'clock, let's uh, let's take our five minute break now, and then when we get back, we can share some of our our tests and give each other feedback, and uh, maybe look at even some results. All right. So I'm going to set up a five minute timer here. Right. See you shortly.
All right, we're back. So let's take some first click tests. So um, I'll just open them up on my screen, and then uh, we can uh, we can have people volunteer to to take the tests. So let's try to get some people who haven't uh, who haven't volunteered to do any of these yet. So I'll just open them up. And I'm just going to pick a random one here. Let's do, uh, OK, JP, you're our first victim. And so who wants to, who wants to volunteer to take JP's test? I'll take that test. So it's Vivian. All right. Hey, Vivian. Hi. Let's do it. So we click on the web design tab. I see web it. Tab. OK, that's pretty straightforward. You ready? Yep. And I would go over, go to the second column of titles that's in the white bar there and go to the web design tab. Okay. Yep. And then that's Perfect. right. Was it and easy to navigate and why? Yeah, it was easy to navigate. It has a uh, pretty clear titles. All right. So what, so what did you think of that test? Uh, it was pretty straightforward and definitely will let you know whether or not uh, your, your web design or that particular title was in a place that was easy to find for any web designers who may be looking for it. Okay. Do, and do, do, you think the, do you think the question was, was, would have been useful to a tester? Um, depending on what the tester was looking for, I guess, if that was like their only, the only objective was to see whether or not a person could click on that tab within like one second or something. I think it, <laughs> yeah. yes, definitely. <laughs> yes. do you think that's a, a realistic request to make of somebody who is using that, uh, click on the web design tab? Is that kind of what the, the user would be thinking of when they were using this site? Um, may, I mean. Look, I don't have enough of the website in my memory now <laughs> to answer, but um, like if you, if it was a very specific, if the goal was very specific, I think that the, um, the test is, would be helpful for that reason. But for me, um, I feel like it would be a time sensitive goal if I wanted to know how quickly somebody could find it as opposed to whether they could find it at all. That's a, that's a really good distinction to make because I think the, the question itself was very prescriptive. So rather than rather than asking them to find a kind of information, we specifically told them what link to click on. So that's really interesting. So since we we sort of removed any of the ambiguity around what they were looking for, because we actually told them click on this specific button. Um, so what we were sort of testing there was how quickly they could find that, just like Vivian was saying. But what we maybe weren't testing there was their ability to find a certain kind of information since we just told them what to click. So maybe if maybe if we were to do another iteration of that, we might want to be a little bit less specific and just say, uh, you know, look for uh, you're looking you're looking for web design content, rather than telling them specifically click on the web design link. So uh -huh. we we want to see how they find the web design content rather than just whether they're able to find that specific link. If that makes sense. Does anybody else have any thoughts around that? Yeah, I thought that was, um, I knew that there was something off with the question, that it was too direct, but I, I couldn't put together two and two as to why, um, because I always felt like tests are meant to be slightly vague, to give a better test, I guess, so to speak. Right, and I think this, this question was, was, I think the word that I would use is prescriptive. So it was telling the user what to do, uh, rather than asking them what they would do. Does that distinction make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So what's what's another way we might be able to phrase the question? I believe it, it said click on the web design link. Anyone have any ideas? And by the way, this is not not to pick on uh, 
on the person who made the test at all. It's just like so that we can get this discussion going around around best practices because we can always improve these. I'll probably rephrase to where would you search for web design? Mm -hmm. Yep, and and we can even give these in the in the form of a prompt, like uh, like like. Uh, or you're you're looking for you're yeah you're looking for web design content. Where would you click? Uh, yeah, what, what you said works works very well. All right, so let's move on to our next victim, and I'm just gonna pick a random one here. Let's do Norris. And who wants to be the tester? Uh, I can take it. Kelsey. Okay, cool. Thanks, Kelsey. So where would you click to start shopping? Ready? Yep. Uh, I would actually probably go to sale. Okay. Uh, if just like browsing the site, I like to start there. Cool. And why would you, why would you click there? Uh, well, I feel like I just said that. Uh, yeah, if um, I'm just doing a general browsing session, then I usually start in the sales section. So that's why I would click there. Because I'm poor. <laughs> so this is this is really, really interesting because I think, oh, sorry, there's another question before we get into that. Yeah. Tempted to uh, details. So the other place I would be tempted would be shop all. Um, but I also might use like the search function in the top corner mm -hmm. if I was looking for something specific. That's really interesting. So it seems like this test, I hate how they disappear. I wish we could keep it up. Maybe if I click back. Nope. Um, so what was really interesting here, or actually, what was that website? Uh, maybe we can just go to the website. Uh, it's Oli Ella. I can, um, how do you spell it? Uh, O L L I. Like that? Oli Ella? Yeah. And then space Ella, E double L A. Cool. I think we found it. Okay, great. Uh, North America. So that was really, this was really interesting because um, it seemed like what it was testing kind of was user preferences. Uh, since the question itself was pretty vague, it was just how would you start shopping? It's asking the user like what they, what they would looking for, lo start looking for if they were shopping since it was left, left very general. And Kelsey said she would go right to the sale, which is to totally what I think a lot of people would do. Um, but what we weren't necessarily testing as much here was the usability. So. For this question, it was very general. We might actually want to be a little more specific because we're trying to see if a user is able to find a specific type of content. Whereas here, we were just kind of asking the user what kind of content they would look for. So Does where, how would you, I was thinking the other thing, um, the other question I was thinking of was actually, where would you go to shop for a baby trolley? Or actually, where would you, the first question was, you need to buy a baby gift. Where would you look for a baby trolley? But yep. I thought that was too specific. Mm -hmm. So I think that, that question actually works really well. If, if what we're trying to do is, if we're trying to under, see whether the user understands the information architecture, understands how the site fits together, asking where they would find something specific is actually a really, a really good approach. Okay. So uh, it's funny, we, for these two first two tests that we looked at, one was very prescriptive, telling the user exactly what to click. And the second one was, was more vague, asking the user what they would look for. And I think those are really good examples that highlight the kind of middle ground we want to look for, which is telling the user what type of information to find, but not telling them how to get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, so yeah. Cool. No, so it's all about finding finding that that perfect balance of uh, of specificity and and but enough vagueness to to give the user room uh, to to try different things and to find out what's going on in their heads. So so uh, I think you you gave us a really good example there with the baby trolley. So let's move on to another one. Uh, okay, let's do let's do Joshua. And who wants to be our tester? I'll go ahead. All right, thanks, Miguel. So, where would you click to see items in your shopping cart? Ready? Yep. Uh, I would 
click on the top right where the search bar next to the search bar uh, right here yep cool and why did you choose that spot because it was a shopping bag oh yes because it's a shopping bag and this is an interesting follow-up so what was the level of difficulty um i would say a two okay Cool. So that was an interesting follow-up. So we're, we're not only gauging where the user clicks, but also how hard it was for them to decide. So uh, one thing that we talked about was the amount of time that it takes for a first click study for someone to make their decision. What we're doing here is we're adding another element wh where we're asking them how difficult they perceived it to be, which is really interesting because sometimes how difficult someone perceived it to be is more important than actually how long it took them. Yeah, I really like that follow-up question. That was yeah. Pretty genius. Yeah, that was a really good addition, Joshua. Does how anybody? Did you, how did you do this? Sorry, sorry to interrupt. But yeah, no. how did you do the scale? Was there a button in there? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I um, I added another question, like when in the spot where it said you could um, kind of add a second question, and then um, what I did with that was there's on the right side it says like short text, and I just chose linear scale. So if you can see my screen, I'm, I'm looking at this here. So when you add a follow up, you can select different types of questions, linear scale, and then you can add start and end values. I agree, because I thought it was really neat, but I wasn't quite sure how to do it. Thank you. Yeah. Did, it, did anybody else ha have any ideas for, uh, for different ways we could have phrased the question or anything like that? And the question was just, what would you click to look at your shopping cart? So one thing we did there was we used uh, the specific language of shopping cart, um, which is in itself a, a, a term that may not be familiar to everyone. Like I know, I know it's really common, but um, one thing we could do is think about instead of telling them uh, to look for a shopping cart, uh, talk about the functionality of a shopping cart and ask it in that context. So rather than saying, where would you go to click on your shopping cart, maybe where would where would you click to see save to see the items that you've saved to check out? Does that make sense? Smart. Yeah. So even a bit more directly tied to what they're trying to accomplish in their shopping cart, rather than just telling them to look for their shopping cart. If that makes sense. Smart. Cool. Awesome. Yeah, I found that because of the language of shopping cart, I was looking for a shopping cart icon. And then I saw the shopping bag instead. And I was like, I guess it's the closest thing. It must be the same. And actually, I, I took this test too while we were doing our in-class assignment. And I also gave it a difficulty of two. And the reason that I didn't say it was completely easy was because I had that pause where I was like, I'm looking for the shopping cart, but this is the shopping bag. So that was where any, any confusion that there was was just because it, I was able to look for this specific thing, but the symbol didn't quite match up with what I was looking for. I gave, I gave it a, the same review for the same reason. Cool. All right. This is fun. Uh, should we do one more? I'll take that. Yes. <laughs> I want to do one more. OK. Um, who else do we got? Uh, let's do let's do Christina's. All right, who wants to be Christina's tester? I can do it. All right, sounds good, Ivan. So, where would you click to submit a piece of artwork? Ready? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see the button because of the uh, screens. But I would just click all right on submit. Submit. OK, cool. And why would you click submit? Because it's submitting something. <laughs> so that was, that was pretty straightforward. Is there a follow-up question? Nope, we, did, we didn't have a follow-up question there. Um, what else might we want to learn about that? 
because it's it seemed pretty straightforward, right? And I think, what did you guys think of how the first question was phrased? They'll probably put something that doesn't you submit, like mm. where will you add your art in your profile or something? Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good consideration because um, if the user is thinking of the term submit, then then it might be easy for them to figure that out. But there also might be one more one more step in between because maybe they're just thinking in their head, I want to add artwork to the site. They're not actually thinking of the word submit. So maybe making it a little bit further from the actual language in the button could be could be a, a good consideration. And I just want to put this out there. One of yeah. my results was hilarious. Yeah. I've been in this situation. Uh, that person didn't know a lot about video games and clicked on Borderland when my was to look for Call of Duty. Yep. That kid was, was going to be angry. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. That was me. <laughs> I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> I'm like, I've never played a game in my life. <laughs> I've been there like, Ma, this, this is not the game I wanted. <laughs> OK. So actually, this is a good transition. Does anybody want to? Uh, well, actually, let's take a minute now, just in case anyone hasn't gotten to. Um, I'll actually set a two-minute timer. And let's have everyone take a look at their results. Uh, and then we can, we can see if anyone wants to share any surprising results or maybe considerations of things they would have changed. So I'll just start, I'll just start a two-minute timer for everyone to take a look at the results. And let, let us know if you have any trouble finding them. All right, let's bring it back. So hopefully everyone is able to access their results. Uh, does anybody want to share their screen and, and, and show us their results? I can share. All right, that'd be great, Kelsey. Um, I'll, I'll unshare my screen so you can take over. Yeah, uh, so I got five reviews. Um, and you can see here, we've got two people that clicked on here. Uh, really uh, one person. Uh, really quickly, let's go over what your prompt was here. question is, of course. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, My yeah. prompt was for people, uh, they want to look for a review of a new game that's coming out. And I asked them where they would click to find that. Uh, and yeah, so two people clicked on the search bar. Um, two people clicked down here, which you can't see it because the heat map, but this says games. <laughs> cool. um, and then one person clicked on this little first video that pops up. Cool. And did you have any follow-up uh, questions? Yeah. 
Okay. Did I? Yeah, I had follow-up questions. So I asked them why they chose to click where they did. Um, two of them, you say, see, it says it's tagged gaming. The other two talk about uh, using the search function. And the person, I guess, who clicked on this uh, thought it was for trending topics. Okay. Which is interesting. And then, but, yeah, what did you... Sorry, what was the first question again? It was search for... Uh, for search for what? Uh, a game review. A new, a new game review. Okay, cool, cool. So I, I see that make, I, it makes sense maybe if the person thought that they were already on a gaming site, yeah. then maybe that that first, that trending topic would have been for a new game. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, uh, I asked them what they expected to see after clicking on uh, what they chose to click on. Um, the person who clicked on the ad uh, was expecting yeah. to see pending topics. So they had um, a Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then our, our video game clickers uh, expected to see, like, I guess a highlight of all the, like, latest games mm -hmm. um, or trending games. Yeah. And then uh, those who uh, chose to click on the so search option were expecting basically like a preview of a bunch of links that would show them the game, the specific game they were looking for. Yeah, interesting. So one thing, um, one interesting thing was the way the question was worded actually. Would you mind going back up to the question? Yeah. Was, Look for a review of a new game that's coming out. I think that could have been interpreted a couple different ways. Uh, one is you already know what the game is, and you're looking to review a specific game. And the other way is uh, you're looking for a review of any new game. Uh, like you don't have a specific game in mind yet. So mm -hmm. it seemed like that was interpreted a couple different ways. Uh, one person, in they, they said that they clicked the search result, the search bar, so that they could search for a name of name of game review. So that means they already had an idea of what the new game was. Uh, but it seemed like the second one said, I would just search for game reviews, I think it was, uh, mm -hmm. and then see which thumbnails looked interesting. So one yeah. thing to when writing the questions is make sure that there's no uh, ambiguity around yeah. the issue of the question. So that's it's really interesting how sometimes that only comes out in the test results once you see yeah, how people yeah. interpret it differently. Yeah, it's especially interesting because I was trying to find a middle ground between like something specific and something vague because I could have said like, oh, search for a video you want to find. And that would have been like mm -hmm. really vague and people could have kind of clicked anywhere because yeah. of that. Um, and uh, But I also could have been like, search for the new like, or search for reviews of like The Witcher 3. Like, where will you click for that? Right. Um, and what did and you that, have in mind with this question? Were you think when you did write this question, were you thinking of a specific game or just that you're browsing for a new game in general? I was expecting that people were gonna search for a game they wanted to find. But I was kind of expecting that that could be a video game or a board game or like really any kind of game that they specifically were interested in. And I kind of expected them to click on either the game button or the search bar. Got it. And so you thought they would have a specific game in mind? I think so, yeah. OK, yeah. OK, cool, cool. And um, does, maybe we can get some input from, from the rest of the, the class. Does anybody else have any ideas on how we could have phrased the question if, it, if we're looking, asking people to search for a specific game that they already had in mind? I, I would have put some specific, um, maybe put uh, an interesting game that you're already thinking of that's coming out, a game that, you, uh, that you've expected that's coming out, something like that. Because um, that would have been a little bit more clear. There's, there's different ways. You know, a lot of people do know YouTube. <laughs> Right. I, I think, uh, like you said, like contextualizing it a little bit, like like you have tell them you have a specific game in mind. Maybe even say something like, um, "You played you played a new game at your friend's house last night. Yeah, now you want to search for it." Uh, so it's not something that lets that contextualizes the game in their life. Like, uh, uh, yeah, maybe you you heard you heard about a new, uh, you know, you heard about a new version of a game you like. 
how do you find it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. This is a really good example. Uh, thank you for presenting, Kelsey. Uh, hey. Does uh, does anybody else want to step up? Maybe someone who hasn't participated yet. I'll share mine real quick. All right, that'd be great. The result was interesting. Cool. Thanks, Brandon. So this one, I use Google Calendar, and I asked participants where to where would they click to add an event. Hmm. Okay. Everyone, I'll pull up the actual Google Calendar. So everyone, click. Can you guys see my mouse? Yeah. Okay, so everyone clicked on the plus sign, which makes sense, but it's actually that function serves as to add-ons for Google Calendar. Yeah. And to actually add something, you just click on the calendar. So I thought it was funny. That, like, if I was taking it, I would have clicked on the plus sign too, but that's actually not where you go to add it. Yeah. I wonder if it would have been different if you had been able to see that create button in the top left there, because that also adds a, an event, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So that, that was really interesting because it was actually just the subsection of the page. And yeah. I think uh, it seems like the create button is the primary call to action on the page, whereas clicking on the calendar is sort of the uh, almost like the advanced way or the shortcut for adding mm -hmm. events. So it was, it was really interesting because the, the context changed sort of because it, the primary call to action was cro cropped out. So people were looking for some button. Yeah, that's true. It yeah. was like that. I didn't think of that. But. Yeah. And wait, how many people took this test? Uh, just three. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And did anyone, anyone who took the test want to talk about their experience? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I was in it, I was like, wait, I use calendar all the time. Why do I not? <laughs> <know>? uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely my first instinct was to kind of like click within the calendar itself. And then I don't know why, but then I saw the add button. I was like, maybe this is how you can do it too. So I clicked on to the plus sign on, on the right. Yeah, that's okay. one really interesting thing is that, I mean, I think maybe people felt like they had too many options or look, you're looking for something specific to click on. Um, I wonder how this would have been different if you had said uh, add an event at 2 p.m. on Tuesday. That probably would have changed it a lot. Yeah, because I think maybe, maybe people people didn't know where on the calendar they were going to add the event, so they maybe weren't thinking uh, in context of time. They were thinking of just adding an event in general. Definitely, yeah. The time would have probably made people click on. Yeah. What, what would have been really interesting would be to see if you if you did show the whole screenshot, including the the main create button in the top left, and then said. Uh, what if you create if it asked them to create an event at two o'clock on Tuesday? Seeing how many people click right on the calendar versus click that create button, that could be something really interesting to learn for Google. Yeah, yeah. I cool. feel like people click it too more. Yeah. But. There's so there's also I I didn't take this. I use Google Calendar a lot, and I feel like it's more intuitive adding a event when you have a blank calendar in front of you. Yeah. Um, like if you had like deselected your calendar so that the events weren't on the screen and it was sort of a blank slate, I think it might have been a little bit more intuitive to like click on an empty spot to add an event. Um, yeah. yeah, having that all these sense. events already here, you're like, oh, I guess if I click on one of these, then like I'm looking at details about that event and like where do I click to add one? Although that's probably, since that's a point of friction, a possible point of confusion, like adding an event on top of an event, also could be a, a good thing to test separately. Like, like if you ask somebody to create an event at 2, at two o'clock on a Tuesday on a blank calendar versus on a full calendar, do they behave differently? Maybe if it's full, they're going to use that create button, whereas if it's empty, they'll click right on the calendar. So that would be something, that would be interesting insight too. Did, uh, did you have any follow-up questions, Brandon? Um, it was just one. I said, is there a specific type of icon that you look for? To oh, add an event? cool. Yeah, yeah it that looks like sense. everybody was looking for a, for a plus sign. Yeah. And it was just the, it, the plus sign we saw was just in a different context. Yeah. So I kind of messed up by cropping it, I guess, but. No, no, no. That, that was actually, I'm actually really glad that came up because it, uh, it led to this discussion.
Does, uh, does anybody else, one more person want to share? I feel like we're uncovering new insights with each one of these. I'd like to share mine. Yeah, mm -hmm. Here we go. So seven people did mine. And uh, this is the one that I just found hilarious. Because uh, the story was uh, your nephew just asked you uh, for that new Call of Duty game. And he tells you it has an Xbox. So you Google and you land it in, in GameStop. Uh, what were you click first? Uh, so the majority of people, <coughs> they click on the search bar here. Uh, yeah, it's pretty normal. You just put Call of Duty and, you know, Call of Duty pops out. Um, so a lot of people were like, yeah, we'll just go to video games. I know that Call of Duty is a video game, so I'll go to video game. Uh, it's a fine game, so it does this right there. And um, the one that I started, hilarious, really, was the one that says, Seemed like it was a popular game. <laughs> Where was it? Oh, I don't know much about games, but this seemed popular. That was the one that went to Borderland 3. <laughs> That's really interesting because someone might hear from their nephew about a specific game and want to get them get the nephew a present, but not know anything about games. <laughs> I think that's a, a typical parent experience. Is like, oh, I heard there's this toy that all the kids bought. <laughs> if I can find the right one, and then you, they end up getting something. Cool. <laughs> it was it was super interesting finding that out. That among yeah. us, uh, there's person don't know a lot about video games. Yeah, and. Um, I, I found it interesting, really. Mm -hmm. uh, but mostly, I, I expected people to go like electronics, where you find consoles yeah. or video games, where you find all the video games and all that. I think what's really interesting in, across most of these is to see uh, when people tend to use search versus when they tend to use browse functionality. When does it seem like people will use search? Uh, to find something specific? Yeah, when, like the, when they already know what they're looking for. Uh, yeah. like people use browse when they're a little bit less familiar or if they or if they're, they're looking for a certain type of thing but don't know specifically what see like for example uh, i know call of duty is a video game uh, that one probably clicked on video games yeah and they're just gonna browse a lot of games and then find call of duty and then find the console and I think a lot, a lot of it is also how confident you feel in, in the website searchability. So like Amazon, it has really flexible search. So you can search, you can like almost put in a description or like some keywords, and it's really good at directing you to the right kind of thing. Whereas maybe GameStop, I don't know how advanced their search is, but uh, maybe you have to type, you have to really get the name right, uh, and it, or it's not going to give you the right suggestion. So maybe a site like this you'd end up browsing. Uh, and, and I think I usually test in the waters on sites like this. Like I start typing and see what kind of suggestions it gives me. And it's giving, if it's giving me a lot of good suggestions, then I'll keep typing. But if it's, if it's not really giving me any suggestions, then maybe I'll start browsing. To GameStop, what they do is they like to put those good uh, collector's edition first. That costs 150 more. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that's another thing is how the website prioritizes the information. But yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Thank, thanks so much for that, guys. Um, yeah. So um, let's do. Uh, that, that's actually we're actually ahead of time for once today. So may, maybe we'll get a few minutes back. Uh, but I wanted to, let's get a head start and start talking about today's event. All right, unless, does anybody have any questions about any anything that we learned there today? Best practices for, for writing questions? Um, I do have a question about yeah. the results. Yeah. Um, so if you, got, if you get a tie, um, like what action would you take as a designer? Yeah, if, so if you, if you get a tie like between 
two options, like if some, mm -hmm. like half the people are pressing video games and half the people are using search. Um, yeah, so um, I guess you, you want to focus on uh, which of those options is going to get the user the information faster based on your website, because the goal is to get them to Weatherly for most efficiently. And then you want to figure out how to better communicate that that's the fastest way to get there. So um, if, um, I don't know if yeah if our if our example was find find Call of Duty, uh, then and if say search is the fastest way to get there, then maybe there's something we can do to clarify that search is the fastest way to get there. Like we can say like type the name of a video game in search just to make sure that we're really guiding them there. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, yes, it does. So to an yeah. certain extent, we could kind of look at it backwards, reverse engineer. We can go, okay, what is actually the fastest way to get to this information? And then how do we make it clear that that's the best path? Cool, thank you. Yeah, no problem. I did notice that on my website, um, which was the Mint, they had several places for you to actually be able to add an account. Is that for a test result such as Gabe's where like there are multiple points that people would consider uh, actually, going in? Mind if we take a look at that just to visualize it? Yes. Cool. Do you want to share your screen? See if I. Yep. So, um, everyone, obviously, they clicked here on add account to start a new one, but you can also do it in your settings. And you can also, uh, here, where is it? Your accounts. Um, add a new account. Uh, you can add them into your profiles. <laughs> you can just so many different places that you can do it. And it was very interesting. That's very interesting. See yeah. that. A lot of time it's about striking the balance between making something accessible, but then also making the paths clear. So if they really want to emphasize that and they want to make it so you can add an account from any context, they can do things like, it looks like they put a shortcut to it basically in the navigation. So maybe they found yeah. that, one of, that yeah. was one of the primary workflows. And so they wanted to make sure it wasn't just buried in the settings. So they pull it out and put in a shortcut. And uh, I mean, you'll see that in other apps like right. Yelp, for example. Uh, like if you go to Yelp, you notice there are a lot of shortcuts like, um, you know, like restaurants around me or, uh, once you search, then you can, there's a button that says open now. So they found out kind of what the most common tasks are on different mm -hmm. screens. And then they make sure that, that those tasks are accessible on those screens. So here it seems like adding accounts is a big thing that people do. So they pepper yeah. it all over the place. Uh, and yeah. I think when it comes to doing that, it can be a little bit thorny because when you have, when you end up with two, the same call to action twice on the same screen, like there it was in the settings, but you could still see the shortcut in the navigation, you start to question which is the right one. So I think to do that well, like it's okay to put the same thing in different parts of the website, but best practice would probably be to only have one visible at a time. Because otherwise you get decision anxiety where it's like, which is the right one? Are these actually the same thing? One says add account, the other said, says add accounts, plural. Um, so being able to strike that right balance between making that accessible anywhere, um, but then there in lots of different contexts, but making sure that at no point is it confusing as to as to which one does what. Cool. All right. Any any other takeaways? So that, uh, any any surprises here? Or any patterns anyone noticed around writing the questions or the follow-ups? All right, cool. So let's let's take a quick look at today's assignment. I'll reshare my screen. So we're we're back to uh, back to the Newsy app today. So we're going to run a few different types of tests. And they're all going to be in Usability Hub, so it'll be a really similar flow uh, to what, what you did for your first click test today in class. So um, you're going to start by creating two sketches or wireframes of the home page for the Newsy app. Uh, so two different versions of the same home page. And then once those are created, you're going to use Usability Hub to create a preference test. 
So that's comparing the two designs. And that's just going to be one of the options too when you go to create a new test. So going back to my dashboard here, when you click create a new test, it'll give you the option to create a preference test. And remember, you're going to create these all as separate projects, not put the same tests in the same one, just because it's limitation of the basic account. So first, you're creating a preference test with the two designs. Then you'll create a five-second test with just one of the designs. So we're looking to see what, what uh, the user understands about a page uh, from, the, from just looking at it for five seconds. And you can reference uh, today's slideshow, which I'll share. Um, to see the kinds of questions that you should ask. Like, what is the purpose of the design you just saw? What are the main parts of the page you recall? Actually, I think it's in the training kit. Uh, here we go. So it's uh, it's here in the training kit, actually. Those are the types of questions you could ask for the, for the five second test. And then the first click test with one design. So you should be pretty familiar with first clicks, first click tests after what we did in class. Then you're going to send your test to your classmates, your TLs, and to anyone else who's agreed to help with the research. Uh, you're required to get at least, this is one, I'm going to change it to three because one is too small. You're required to get at least three responses to one of your usability hub tests, raising the bar. And then uh, you're going to record your responses in a separate document, highlighting what was expected and what was surprising. And I think. Um, one good thing to do, one good practice here would be to write down your expectations before you look at the results, just so that they're not, so that your hindsight isn't colored by looking at the results. And then include an additional paragraph describing the potential implications of your findings and what they'll have on the final product. So how you might interpret those, maybe what some of the limitations are of, of having only a small sample size. And then as a stretch goal, attempt to create high fidelity designs prior to testing. And um, so this is really good for the, for the preference test. So what you could do is, is start out with the wireframes, create all three tests, and then, uh, and then only test the five second test and the first click test at first. And then if you have time, uh, create the high fidelity design and then do the preference test. But just make sure that you get all three created in low fidelity, but you can just share the second two if you want, if you, if you intend to also create the preference one in high fidelity. Does that make sense? Uh, kind of confusing. So we're creating two landing, two home pages. Yes. Um, no follow-ups from it, just like just two, two home pages. And one will be five seconds test, and one would be the first click test. And the so yeah, one would be five second test, one would be first click test, and then you would create a preference test where you compare both of them. Okay, thank you. And my recommendation is to do the, create all those tests in low fidelity, just either sketch or wireframe. And if you want to go for the stretch goal, then you can create the high fidelity and, and uh, do the preference test using the high fidelity. But make sure that you, you, but to make sure that you get your three test results, First, you can send out the five second and the first click test. So these are all uh, tests based on the home screen, home page, or newsy news. Yep, exactly. Okay. Cool. Anyone have any question about today's assignment? So um, you either can sketch or Creates like a wireframe. Yes. Is that what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. And okay, then gotcha. for, stretch. for stretch, you can do high fidelity, but since that's a stretch, make sure you get it all, every, all the low fidelity tests set up first. Okay. So make sure you have the low fidelity. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. And there's no, no specific word count for today. It's just write an additional paragraph describing the potential implications of your findings. Uh, I had one more question. If yeah. we already have a home page for Newsy, can we like use one of them and then create an additional one, or are we creating like two new things? I'll try to create two new things, just uh, so we're always stretching our minds and looking for more options yeah. in that crazy eights mindset. Any other questions? 
Okay, cool. So now that we went over today's assignment, I just wanted to take a few minutes just to talk about the assignments and the sprint challenges in general. So it came to my attention that um, there have been some issues with some folks uh, not submitting the sprint challenges on time or, or not necessarily following the guidelines that we laid out. So I, I just wanted to give everybody kind of a reminder that we're here to, to treat this like, like a job. This is, uh, this is about you know, becoming a capable, but also like a dependable designer. And a big part of that is good communication. So um, there, are, there are a couple of issues that, I, that I've heard about. One, it sounds like is time management for some folks. And the other one is, uh, is following the guidelines. So like when it comes to following the guidelines, I know sometimes sometimes you might not agree with the guidelines. Sometimes you might not agree with uh, what's being asked of you, and that happens a lot in the office too. But I just want to stress that that's where communication comes in, because there's always going to be friction. Um, but the way to approach that is if you if you if the guidelines are unclear or if you don't agree with them, you want to reach out, reach out to the TLs or reach out to the instructor, talk about why the guidelines don't make sense to you or why maybe you don't think it's worthwhile. And, and we can talk about that and we can adjust from there and maybe maybe we'll incorporate that into future assignments. But I just wanna make sure for, for everybody's sake that you're following the guidelines and, and not just ignoring them because then, um, then both you're not getting what we want you to get out of the assignment, um, but um, also then it, it, it does make it tougher for, for us to be able to give you a good score on that evaluation. So we wanna work with you. We wanna make sure that the guidelines make sense and the projects line up with the material, which I know since there are a lot of moving parts, sometimes that isn't always the case, but that's why it makes that two-way communication makes it better for everybody if we can make those improvements. So uh, please don't just ignore the guidelines if you don't agree with them. Uh, make sure that, that you're keeping those, those communication open. Um, and then when it comes to time management, uh, the TLs are here to work with you. So if you're, if you're finding that you're spending too much time on certain parts of the design process, getting caught up in the weeds and not, not, not able to finish the whole scope of the assignment, uh, talk to us and let us know what parts you might be struggling with. But uh, time management is also really important here. And it's also really important in a team because if you're not able to get the full scope of a project done in the time that you say uh, you're going to get it done and then it can end up holding up other people. Uh, and then, uh, you know, that can, that can kind of bring everybody down. So uh, for the sake of practicing for being a designer in the real world, uh, time management and, and following the guidelines are two areas where it's really, really important to keep those lines of communication open. Um, so, uh, yeah, just wanted to give everybody a reminder to keep doing that. Um, please just don't, don't ignore the deadlines or the guidelines. Um, and we're, we're, here to, we're here to help you and support you. So, um, yeah. Does that, anybody have any questions about that? Any, any general patterns or struggles that you've been running into with the assignments? Uh, when you say guidelines, what sorry, what do you mean? Is it the instructions or what we? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the instructions for the assignment. So the instructions for the assignment. Um, so like if it, if it says to write three hundred to five hundred words about a topic and it seems like there's not enough to say, um, then uh, don't don't just write two hundred words. Instead. Maybe uh, really push yourself to, to think about how this topic relates to other topics we're thinking about. This is really about getting in the repetitions. It's just like, like exercise. Um, it might seem repetitive, but this is about like making it second nature to do this kind of thinking and kind of writing. So like I, I always tie things back to the crazy eights exercise because I love it. Um, but like maybe you come up with four designs and you're like, oh, that's enough. Um, but if you, if you push yourself to do four more designs, then you end up coming up with the really creative ideas. And I was talking the other day about how it, at my job at ZenReach the other day, it was actually the eighth thing that I came up with when I thought I was completely out of ideas that ended up being the direction that we chose to go with. So really push yourself to think more, think about connecting things. Uh, don't just do it as like, you know, something, something that you need to get done. Just regurgitate some words onto the page. Really try, try to connect these concepts and deepen your understanding. So how do you find the balance between your time management and following the rubric? Because sometimes like you'll go to do the crazy eights method and you can only come up with four designs in the eight minutes. Do you then stretch the time or do you stick within the time and just use what you have? Uh, I would say make yourself come up with eight designs, even if some of them are just kind of scribbles or even if you just write like two words, that's okay, that counts. Maybe if it just says like, I would make a survey, 
that counts as a design. So for the crazy eight specifically, make sure you're timing yourself for one minute per frame and just getting something out of there, even if it's just like a picture of a cat, just to, just to keep your brain moving uh, and expanding in different directions. And in terms of, in terms of time management, uh, yeah, work, work on time boxing if you can. So maybe take a few minutes at the beginning to be like, okay, I need to do a crazy eights. I need to uh, do a, a low fidelity wireframe and then I need to write, uh, write a paragraph about it. So just kind of maybe think about how long each of those things should take. So, okay, crazy eights, that's pretty clearly time boxed. So I'm gonna give myself 10 minutes to that. The wireframes, that's a little bit more unknown. So I wanna make sure I have at least an hour and a half to work on it. And then the paragraph, I don't know, maybe it's gonna take half an hour if I'm having trouble coming up with good content. So thinking about how long each thing should take and then just keeping track of the time. So a lot of the time it, it involves like making sure you're meeting the minimum requirements of everything before you go into that, before you go too deep in any one part. So maybe your wireframes aren't perfect, but you wanna make sure you get some of your, your, uh, your blog posts done before, before they're even perfect. And maybe that's a good opportunity to write about why you're struggling in getting them to a place that you want them to be. But just making sure that you do get to every part of the assignment within the scope of the time. Does anyone have any other concerns? Cool. The, so the main takeaway is just communication because the expectations are never the same. This happens and this happens when you're working as a designer in a company. Uh, but just making sure, like, you can even you can even reach out and say, like, hey, something something came up. I'm gonna have to submit this a little bit late, and that happens all the time. Um, but setting those expectations rather than just submitting it late is a really important. Uh, really important habit to get into. Cool. Oh, got some things in the chat. Vivian says, that's a great summary of the why for some of these guidelines. The V focus timer is helpful for me to avoid getting stuck on some of the assignment. I step away when the timer sounds and come back fresh. Yeah, so I don't know if anyone's familiar with the Pomodoro method. Uh, the Pomodoro method is yes. <laughs> Thanks, Joshua. So I've I've had a lot of success doing that too. Pomodoro method is just basically uh, using a timer when you're working to do like uh, increments of work and then increments of break. And you can adjust what those are. But a common one is do 25 minutes of work and then five minute break, then 25 minutes of work and five minute break. And it's not about stopping at a good stopping point. It's just about forcing yourself to take a break, step away, and then come back and doing that, doing that on a repetitive scale. So I definitely recommend that. And there are a lot of good apps like Pomodoro Timer for doing that too. So it take, forces you to take a step back, think about what you've been focusing on and where you need to focus next in order to keep adjusting. So you don't find yourself going down a rabbit hole of spending 90% of your time on, on just the high fidelity mockups or something like that. Anyone have any other techniques they recommend? I look at how many um, objectives, tasks we have, um, and then I divide them by the amount of hours that we have, and I have to stick to that. Oh, okay. That's, that's... Um, some of them are more prioritized than others, um, but most of the time I do divide it by the amount of hours that we have to work on them. Okay, cool, cool. And sometimes adjust that by which ones you think will take longer. Right. That's generally a good rule of thumb. So having some sort of framework in place to just to keep yourself, uh, keep yourself on time, because especially with high fidelity, for me, high fidelity, I'll spend, I'll spend weeks and weeks <laughs> just like adjusting the designs, try to get them perfect. But a lot of time you just need to do 20% uh, of the work to get it 80% of the way there so that then you can hand it off to somebody and they can start doing their work. And then maybe later you can tweak it to get it the, the rest of the 20% there. There's a, there's a saying that, that you get you get 80% of the value in 20% of the time, and then the next 20% of the value in 80% of the time. Wait, did I say that right? The first, <laughs> wait, let me see what that quote is.
the 80-20 rule is one of the most helpful concepts for time and life manage life and time management. The Pareto principle. You get 20% of your activities will account for 80% of your results. Yeah. So especially if you're working in like a small company with a lot of resources, it's all about learning where you, what 20% of work you can put in to get 80% of the value. So think of it from that mindset for your assignments, figure out how you can get that first 80% of the way there as fast as possible, which is basically meet all the, meet all of the, all of the baseline requirements. And then with any time left, you can think of how you can get it the next 20% of the way there. All right, guys. So uh, great, great work today. I really appreciated everyone's participation. This was really awesome. Uh, I think we, we, we came up with a lot of good examples to highlight, uh, highlight different concepts. And I really appreciate the people who stepped up to share. And uh, so for once, we'll actually end three minutes early and in enjoy, uh, enjoy your extra three minutes of lunch. And I'll see you all tomorrow for part two of usability testing. Bye. All right. Bye. Hi, everyone.